Chapter Six of The Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six. Fessenden comes. It was about nine o'clock the next morning when Rob Fessenden rang the bell of the Van Norman house. Having heard nothing of the events of the night, he had called to offer any assistance he might give before the ceremony. The trailing garland of white flowers with fluttering streamers of white ribbon that hung beside the portal struck a chill to his heart. "'What can have happened?' he thought blankly, and confused ideas of motor accidents were thronging his mind as the door was opened for him. The demeanor of the footman at once told him that he was in a house of mourning. Shown into the drawing-room, he was met by Cicely Dupuy. "'Mr. Fessenden!' she exclaimed as she greeted him. "'Then you have not heard?' "'I've heard nothing. What is it?' Poor Miss Dupuy had bravely taken up the burden of telling the sad story to callers who did not know of it, and this was not the first time that morning she had enlightened inquiring friends. In a few words she told Mr. Fessenden of the events of the night before. He was shocked and sincerely grieved. Although his acquaintance with Miss Van Norman was slight, he was Schuyler Carleton's oldest and best friend, and so he had come from New York the day before in order to take his part at the wedding. While they were talking, Kitty French came in. As Mr. Fessenden began to converse with her, Cicely excused herself and left the room. "'Isn't it awful?' began Kitty, and her tear-filled eyes supplemented the trite sentence. "'It is indeed,' said Rob Fessenden, taking her hand in spontaneous sympathy. "'Why should she do it?' "'She didn't do it,' declared Kitty earnestly. Mr. Fessenden, they all say she killed herself, but I know she didn't. Won't you help me to prove that, and to find out who did kill her? What do you mean, Miss French? Miss Dupuy just told me it was a suicide. They all say so, but I know better. Oh, I wish somebody would help me. Molly doesn't think as I do, and I can't do anything all alone. Miss French's face was small and flower-like, and when she clasped her little hands and bewailed her inability to prove her belief, young Fessenden thought he had never seen such a perfect picture of beautiful helplessness. Without reserve, he instantly resolved to aid and advise her to the best of his own ability. "'And Mrs. Markham doesn't think as I do either,' went on Kitty. Nobody thinks as I do. I will think as you do, declared Fessenden, and so potent was the charm of the tearful violet eyes that he was quite ready to think whatever she dictated. Only tell me what to think and what to do about it. Why, I think Madeline didn't kill herself at all. I think somebody else killed her. "'But who would do such a thing? "'You see, Miss French, I know nothing of the particulars. "'I saw Miss Van Norman for the first time yesterday.' "'Had you never met her before?' "'Oh, yes, a few years ago. "'But, I mean, I came to Mapleton only yesterday "'and saw her in the afternoon. "'I was to be Schuyler's best man, you know.' and as he didn't come here to dinner last night, I thought I'd better not come either, though I had been asked. He was a little miffed with Miss Van Norman, you know. Yes, I know. Matty did flirt with Tom, and it always annoyed Mr. Carleton. Did you dine with him? Yes, at his home. I am staying there. By the way, I met Miss Burt there. Do you know her? No, not at all. Who is she? She's a companion to Mrs. Carleton, Schuyler's mother. 
I never saw her until last night at dinner. No, I don't know her, repeated Kitty. I don't believe she was invited to the wedding, for I looked over the list of invitations. Still, her name may have been there. The list was so very long. And now there'll be no wedding and no guests. No, said Kitty. Only guests at a far different ceremony. Again the deep violet eyes filled with tears, and Fessenden was conscious of a longing to comfort and help the poor little girl thrown thus suddenly into the first tragedy of her life. It would be dreadful enough if she had died from an illness, he said. But this added awfulness. Yes, interrupted Kitty. But to me the worst part is for them to say she killed herself, and I know she didn't. Why, Maddy was too fine and big-natured to do such a cowardly thing. She seemed so to me, too, though of course I didn't know her so well as you did. No, I'm one of her nearest friends, though Madeline was never one to have really intimate friends. But as her friend, I want to try to do what I can to put her right in the face of the world. And you said you'd help me. She looked at Fessenden with such hopefully appealing eyes that he would willingly have helped her in any way he could. But he also realized that it was a very serious proposition this young girl was making. "'I will help you, Miss French,' he said gravely. I know little of the details of the case, but if there is the slightest chance that you might be right, rest assured that you shall be given every chance to prove it. Kitty French gave a sigh of relief. Oh, thank you, she said earnestly. But I'm afraid we cannot do much, however well we intend. Of course, I'm merely a guest here, and I have no authority of any sort. And, too, to prove that Maddie did not kill herself would mean having a detective and everything like that. I may not be everything like that, said Fessenden with a faint smile, but I am a sort of detective in an amateur way. I've had quite a good deal of experience, and though I wouldn't take a case officially, I'm sure I could at least discover if your suspicion have any grounds. But I haven't any suspicions, said Kitty, agitatedly clasping her little hands against her breast. I've only a feeling, a deep, positive conviction that Madeline did not kill herself, and I'm sure I don't know who did kill her. Fessenden gave that grave smile of his and only said, "'That doesn't sound like much to work upon, and yet I would often trust a woman's intuitive knowledge against the most conspicuous clues or evidences.' Kitty thanked him with a smile, but before she could speak Miss Morton came into the room. "'It's perfectly dreadful,' that lady began in her impetuous way. They're going to have the coroner after all. Dr. Leonard has sent for him, and he may arrive at any minute. Isn't it awful? There'll be an inquest, and the house will be thronged with all sorts of people. Why are they going to have an inquest? demanded Kitty, whirling around and grasping Miss Morton by her elbows. Because, she said, quite as excited as Kitty herself, because the doctors think that perhaps Madeline didn't kill herself, that she was, was... Murdered, exclaimed Kitty. I knew it. I knew she was. Who killed her? Mercy, I don't know, exclaimed Miss Morton, frightened at Kitty's vehemence. That's what the coroner is coming to find out. But who do you think did it? You must have some idea. I haven't. Don't look at me like that. What do you mean? It must have been a burglar, went on Kitty, 
because it couldn't have been anyone else. But why didn't he steal things? Perhaps he did. We never thought to look. How you do run on. Nobody could steal the presents, because there was a policeman in the house all the time. Then why didn't he catch the burglar? demanded Kitty, grasping Miss Morton's arm, as if that lady had information that must be dragged from her by force. Feeling interested in getting at the facts in the case, and thinking that he could learn little from these two excited women, Rob Fessenden turned into the hall just in time to meet Dr. Hills, who was coming from the library. "'May I introduce myself?' he said. I'm Robert Fessenden of New York, a lawyer, and I was to have been best man at the wedding. You, I know, are Dr. Hills, and I want to say to you that if the earnest endeavor of an amateur detective would be of any use to you in this matter, it is at your disposal. Mr. Carleton is my old and dear friend, and I need not tell you how he now calls forth my sympathy." Instinctively, Dr. Hills liked this young man. His frank manner and pleasant, straightforward ways impressed the doctor favorably, and he shook hands warmly as he said, "'This is most kind of you, Mr. Fessenden, and you may prove the very man we need. At first we were all convinced that Miss Van Norman's death was a suicide, and though the evidence still strongly points to that, I am sure that there is a possibility, at least, that it is not true. "'May I learn the details of the case? May I go into the library?' said Fessenden, hesitating to approach the closed door until invited. "'Yes, indeed. I'll take you in at once. Dr. Leonard, who is in there, is the county physician, and though a bit brusque in his manner, he is an honest old soul and does unflinchingly what he judges to be his duty. Neither then nor at any time, neither to Dr. Leonard himself nor to anyone else, did Dr. Hills ever mention the difference of opinion which the two men had held for so long the night before, nor did he tell how he had proved his own theory so positively that Dr. Leonard had been obliged to confess himself wrong. It was not in Dr. Hill's nature to say, I told you so, and fully appreciating this, Dr. Leonard said nothing either, but threw himself into the case, heart and soul, in his endeavors to seek truth and justice. Fessenden and Dr. Hills entered the library, where everything was much as it had been the night before. At one time the doctors had been about to move the body to a couch, and to remove the disfigured gown. But after Dr. Leonard had been persuaded to agree with Dr. Hill's view of the case, they had left everything untouched until the coroner should come. The discovery of this was a satisfaction to Robert Fessenden. His detective instinct had begun to assert itself, and he was glad of an opportunity to examine the room before the arrival of the coroner. Though not seeming unduly curious, his eyes darted about in an eager search for possible clues of any sort. Without touching them, he examined the dagger, the written paper, the appointments of the library table, and the body itself, with its sweet, sad face, its drooping posture, and its tragically stained raiment. In true detective fashion, he scrutinized the carpet, glanced at the window fastenings, and noted the appointments of the library table. The only thing Fessenden touched, however, was a lead pencil which lay on the pen rack. It was an ordinary pencil, but he gazed intently at the gilt lettering stamped upon it, and then returned it to its place. Again he glanced quickly but carefully at every article on the table, and then, taking a chair, sat quietly in a corner, unobtrusive but alert. With something of a bustling air, the coroner came in, 
Coroner Benson was a fussy sort of man, with a somewhat exaggerated sense of his own importance. He paused with what he probably considered a dramatic start when he saw the dead body of Miss Van Norman, and, shaking his head, said, "'Alas! Alas!' in tragic tones. Miss Morton and Kitty French had followed him in, and stood arm in arm, a little bewildered, but determined to know whatever might transpire. Cicely Dupuy and Miss Markham had also come in. But after a glance round and a preliminary clearing of his throat, he at once requested that everybody except the two doctors should leave the room. Fessenden and Kitty French were greatly disappointed at this, but the others went out with a feeling of relief, for the strain was beginning to tell upon the nerves of all concerned. As usual, Miss Morton tried to exercise her powers of generalship and directed that they should all assemble in the drawing-room until recalled to learn the coroner's opinion. Mrs. Markham, unheeding Miss Morton's dictum, went away to attend to her household duties, and Cicely went to her own room, but the others waited in the drawing-room. They were joined shortly by Tom Willard and Schuyler Carleton, who arrived at about the same time. Mr. Carleton, never a robust man, looked like a wreck of his former self. Years had been added to his apparent age. His impassive face wore a look of stony grief, and his dark eyes seemed filled with an unutterable horror. Tom Willard, on the contrary, being of stout build and rubicund countenance, seemed an ill-fitting figure in the sad and tearful group. But as Kitty French remarked to Fessenden in a whisper, "'Poor Tom probably feels the worst of any of us, and it isn't his fault that he can't make that fat, jolly face of his look more funereal.' "'And he's said to be the heir to the estate, too,' Fessenden whispered back. "'Now, that's mean of you,' declared Kitty. "'Tom hasn't a greedy hair in his head, and I don't believe he has even thought of his fortune. And besides, he was desperately in love with Madeline, a whole heap more in love than Mr. Carlton was.' Fessenden stared at her. Then why was Carlton marrying her? For her money, said Kitty, with a disdainful air. I didn't know that, went on Fessenden quite seriously. I thought Carlton was hard hit. She was a magnificent woman. Oh, she was indeed, agreed Kitty enthusiastically. Mr. Carlton didn't half appreciate her and Tom did. But then she was always very different with Tom. Somehow she always seemed constrained when with Mr. Carlton. Then why was she marrying him? She was terribly in love with him. She liked Tom only in a cousinly way, but she adored Mr. Carlton. I know it. Well, it seems you were right about her not killing herself, so you're probably right about this matter, too. "'Now that shows a nice spirit,' said Kitty, smiling, even in the midst of her sorrow. "'But truly, I'm most always right, aren't you?' "'I shall be after this, for I'm always going to agree with you.' "'That's a pretty large order, for I'm sometimes awfully disagreeable.' I shouldn't believe that, but I've practically promised to believe everything you tell me, so I suppose I shall have to. Oh, now I have defeated my own ends. Well, never mind. Abide by your first impression, that I'm always right, and then go ahead. Go ahead it is, declared Fessenden, and then Molly Gardner joined them. 
Molly was more overcome by the tragic turn affairs had taken than Kitty, and had only just made her appearance downstairs that day. "'You dear child!' cried Kitty, noting her pale cheeks and sad eyes. "'Sit right down here by us, and let Mr. Fessenden talk to you. He's the nicest man in the world to cheer anyone up.' "'And you look as if you need some cheering, Miss Gardner,' said Fessenden, arranging some pillows at her back as she languidly dropped down on the sofa. "'I can't realize it at all,' said poor Molly. "'I don't want to be silly and keep fainting all over the place, but every time I remember how Maddy looked last night—' She glanced toward the closed library doors with a shudder. "'Don't think about it,' said Rob Fessenden gently. "'What you need most, Miss Gardner, is a bit of fresh air. Come with me for a little walk in the grounds.' This was self-sacrifice on the part of the young man, for he greatly desired to be present when the coroner should open the closed doors to them again. But he really thought Miss Gardner would be better for a short, brisk walk, and getting her some wraps, they went out at the front door. End of chapter 6「Seven of the Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven, Mr. Benson's Questions. It was some time after Fessenden and Molly had returned from their walk that the library doors were thrown open and Coroner Benson invited them all to come in. They filed in slowly, each heart heavy with an impending sense of dread. Dr. Hills ushered them to seats which had been arranged in rows and which gave an unpleasantly formal air to the cozy library. The body of Madeline Van Norman had been taken upstairs to her own room, and at the library table, where she had last sat, stood Coroner Benson. The women were seated in front. Mrs. Markham seemed to have settled into a sort of sad apathy, but Miss Morton was briskly alert, and though evidently nervous, seemed eager to hear what the coroner had to tell. Kitty French, too, was full of anxious interest, and taking the seat assigned to her, clasped her hands in breathless suspense, while a high color rose to her lovely cheeks. Molly Gardner was pale and wan-looking. She dreaded the whole scene, and had but one desire, to get away from Mapleton. She could have gone to her room, had she chosen, but the idea of being all alone was even worse than the present conditions. So she sat, with overwrought nerves, now and then clutching at Kitty's sleeve. Cicely Dupuy was very calm so calm indeed that one might guess it was the composure of an all-compelling determination and by no means the quiet of indifference marie was there and showed the impassive face of the well-trained servant though her volatile french nature was discernible in her quick darting glances and quivering sensitive lips the two doctors mr carleton tom willard and young Fessenden occupied the next row of seats, and behind them were the house servants. Unlike the women, the men showed little or no emotion on their faces. All were grave and composed, and even Dr. Leonard seemed to have laid aside his brusque and aggressive ways. As he stood facing this group, Coroner Benson was fully alive to the importance of his own position, and he quite consciously determined to conduct the proceedings in a way to throw great credit upon himself in his official capacity. After an impressive pause, which he seemed to deem necessary to gain the attention of an already breathlessly listening audience, he began, "'While there is much evidence that seems to prove that Miss Van Norman took her own life 
there is very grave reason to doubt this both of the eminent physicians here present are inclined to believe that the dagger thrust which killed miss van norman was not inflicted by her own hand though it may have been so this conclusion they arrive at from their scientific knowledge of the nature and direction of dagger strokes which as may not be generally known is a science in itself indeed were it not for the conclusive evidence of the written paper these gentlemen would believe that the stroke was impossible of self-infliction but aside from this point we are confronted by this startling fact although the dagger which you may see still lying on the table has several blood stains on its handle there is absolutely no trace of blood on the right hand of the body of miss van norman it is inconceivable that she could have removed such a trace had there been any and it is highly improbable if not indeed impossible that she could have handled the dagger and left it in its present condition without showing a corresponding stain on her hand the speech of coroner benson's produced a decided sensation on all his hearers but it was manifested in various ways kitty french exchanged with fessenden a satisfied nod for this seemed in line with her own theory fessenden returned the nod and even gave kitty a faint smile for who could look at that lovely face without a pleasant recognition of some sort and then he folded his arms and began to think hard yet there was little food for coherent thought granting the logical deduction from the absence of any stain on miss van norman's hands there was as yet not the slightest indication of any direction in which to look for the dastard who had done the deed schuyler carleton showed no emotion but his white face seemed to take on one more degree of horror and misery tom willard looked blankly amazed and Mrs. Markham began on a new one of her successive crying spells. Miss Morton sat bolt upright and placidly smoothed the gray silk folds of her gown, while her face wore a decided, I told you so, expression, though she hadn't told them anything of the sort. But as Fessenden watched her, the rows of seats were slightly horseshoed, and he could see her side face well, he noticed that she was really trembling all over and that her placidity of face was without doubt assumed for effect he could not see her eyes but he was positive that only a strong fear or terror of something could explain her admirably suppressed agitation the behavior of cicely dupuy was perhaps the most extraordinary she flew into a fit of violent hysterics and had to be taken from the room marie followed her as it had always been part of the french maid's duty to attend miss dupuy upon occasion as well as miss van norman in view of this state of affairs went on the coroner when quiet had been restored after cicely's departure it becomes necessary to make an investigation of the case we have absolutely no evidence and no real reason to suspect foul play yet since there is the merest possibility that the death was not a suicide it becomes my duty to look further into the matter i have been told that miss van norman had expressed a sort of general fear that she might some day be impelled to turn this dagger upon herself but that is a peculiar mental obsession that affects many people at sight of a sharp-pointed or cutting instrument, and is by no means a proof that she did do this thing. But quite aside from the temptation of the glittering steel, we have Miss Van Norman's written confession that she at least contemplated taking her own life, and ascribing a reason therefore. In further consideration, then, of this written paper, of which you all know the contents 
can any of you tell me of any fact or quote any words spoken by miss van norman that would corroborate or amplify the statement of this despairing message as mr benson spoke he held in his hand the written paper that had been found on the library table it was indeed unnecessary to read it aloud for everyone present knew its contents by heart but nobody responded to the coroner's question mr carleton looked mutely helpless tom willard looked honestly perplexed and yet many of those present believed that both these men knew the sad secret of madeline's life and understood definitely the written message again mr benson earnestly requested that any one knowing the least fact however trivial regarding the matter would mention it then mrs markham spoke i can tell you nothing but my own surmise she said i know nothing for certain but i have reason to believe that madeline van norman had a deep sorrow such a one as would impel her to write that statement and to act in accordance with it that is what i wish to know said coroner benson it is not necessary for you to detail the nature of her sorrow or even to hint at it further but the assurance that the message is in accordance with miss van norman's mental attitude goes far toward convincing me that her death is the outcome of that written declaration i know too volunteered kitty french that madeline meant every word she wrote there she was miserable and for the very reason that she herself stated. Mr. Benson pinched his glasses more firmly on his nose and turned his gaze slowly toward Miss French. Kitty had spoken impulsively, and perhaps too directly, but, though embarrassed at the sensation she had caused, she showed no desire to retract her statements. "'I am told,' said the coroner his voice ringing out clearly in the strange silence that had fallen on the room that the initial on this paper designates mr schuyler carleton i must therefore ask mr carleton if he can explain the reference to himself i cannot said schuyler carleton and only the intense silence allowed his low whisper to be heard miss van norman was my affianced wife we were to have been married to-day those two facts i think prove the existence of our mutual love the paper is to me inexplicable tom willard looked at the speaker with an expression of frank unbelief and indeed most of the auditors faces betrayed incredulity even with no previous reason to imagine that carleton did not love madeline the tragic message proved it beyond all possible doubt and yet it was but natural for the man to deny it dr hill spoke next i think coroner benson he said as he rose to his feet we are missing the point if miss van norman took her life in fulfillment of her own decision the reasons that brought about that decision are not a matter for our consideration it is for us to decide whether she did or did not bring about her own death and as a mode of procedure may i suggest this dr leonard and myself hold that in view of the absence of any stain on miss van norman's hands she could not have handled the stained dagger that killed her a refutation of this opinion would be to explain how she could have done the deed and left no trace on her fingers unless this can be shown i think we can not call it a suicide although nothing would have induced him to admit it coroner benson was greatly accommodated by this suggestion and immediately adopting it as his own promulgation he repeated it almost exactly word for word as his official dictum and so he concluded as i have now explained unless a theory can be offered on this point 
we must agree that Miss Van Norman's unfortunate death was not by her own hand. Robert Fessenden arose. I have no theory, he said. I have no argument to offer. But I am sure we all wish to discover the truth by means of any light that any of us may throw on the mystery. And I want to say that in my opinion the absence of blood on the hands though it indicates, does not positively prove that the weapon was held by another than the victim. Might it not be that, taking the dagger from the table, clean as of course it was, Miss Van Norman turned it upon herself, and then, withdrawing it, let it drop to the floor, where it subsequently became blood-stained, as did the rug and her own gown? the two doctors listened intently it was characteristic of both that though dr hills had shown no elation when he had convinced dr leonard of his mistake the night before yet now dr leonard could not repress a gleam of triumph in his eyes as he turned to dr hills it is possible said mr benson with a cautiously dubious air though really the theory struck him as extremely probable, and he wished he had advanced it himself. Dr. Hills looked thoughtful, and then, as nobody else spoke, he observed, Mr. Carleton might perhaps judge of that point. As he first discovered the dagger and picked it up from the floor, he can perhaps say if it lay in or near the stains on the carpet. Everybody looked at Schuyler Carleton, but the man had reached the limit of his endurance. "'I don't know,' he exclaimed, covering his white face with his hands, as if to shut out the awful memory. "'Do you suppose I noticed such details?' he cried, looking up again. "'I picked up the dagger, scarce knowing that I did it. It was almost an unconscious act. I was stunned, dazed, at what I saw before me, and I know nothing of the dagger or its blood-stains. Truly the man was almost frenzied, and out of consideration for his perturbed state, the coroner asked him no more questions just then. "'It seems to me,' observed Rob Fessenden, "'that the nature or shape of the stains on the dagger handle might determine this point.' If they appear to be finger marks, the weapon must have been held by some other hand. If merely stains, as from the floor, they might be considered to strengthen Dr. Hill's theory. The Venetian paper cutter was produced and passed around. None of the women would touch it, or even look at it, except Kitty French. She examined it carefully but had no opinion to offer, and Mr. Benson waited impatiently for her to finish her scrutiny. He had no wish to hear her remarks on the subject, for he deemed her a mere frivolous girl who had no business to take any part in the serious inquiry. All were requested not to touch the weapon, which was passed round on a brass tray taken from the library table. Schuyler Carleton covered his eyes and refused to glance at it. Tom Willard and Robert Fessenden looked at it at the same time, holding the tray between them. "'I make out no fingerprints,' said Tom, at last. "'Do you?' "'No,' said Fessenden. "'That is, not surely. "'These may be marks of fingers.' but they are far too indistinct to say so positively. What do you think, Dr. Leonard? The gruesome property was passed on to the two doctors, who examined it with the greatest care. Going to the window, they looked at it with magnifying glasses, and finally reported that the slight marks might be finger marks, or might be the abrasion of the nap of the rug on which the dagger had fallen. "'Then,' said Coroner Benson, "'we have so far no evidence which refutes the theory that Miss Van Norman's written message was the expression of her deliberate intent, 
and that that intention was fulfilled by her. Once more Mr. Benson scanned intently the faces of his audience. "'Can no one, then,' he said again, "'assert or suggest anything that may have any bearing on this written message?' "'I can,' said Robert Fessenden. End of chapter 7Chapter Eight of the Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight, A Soft Lead Pencil. Coroner Benson looked at the young man curiously, knowing him to be a stranger in the household. He had not expected information from him. Your name, he said quietly. I am Robert Fessenden of New York City. I am a lawyer by profession, and I came to Mapleton yesterday for the purpose of acting as best man at Mr. Carleton's wedding. I came here this morning, not knowing of what had occurred in the night, and after conversation with some members of the household, I felt impelled to investigate some points which seemed to me mysterious. I trust I have shown no intrusive curiosity, but I confess to a natural detective instinct, and I noticed some peculiarities about that paper you hold in your hand to which I should like to call your attention. Fessenden's words caused a decided stir among his hearers, including the coroner and the two doctors. Mr. Benson was truly anxious to learn what the young man had to say but at the same time his professional jealousy was aroused by the implication that there was anything to be learned from the paper itself outside of his own information concerning it i was told he said quickly that this paper is positively written in miss van norman's own hand robert fessenden while not exactly a handsome man was of a type that impressed everyone pleasantly he was large and blond, and had an air that was unmistakably cultured and exceedingly well-bred. Conventionality sat well upon him, and his courteous self-assurance had in it no trace of egotism or self-importance. In a word, he was what the plain-spoken people of Mapleton called citified, and though they sometimes resented this combination of personal traits, in their hearts they admired and envied it. This was why Coroner Benson felt a slight irritation at the young man's savoir-faire, and at the same time a sense of satisfaction that there was promise of some worthwhile help. "'I was told so, too,' said Fessenden, in response to the coroner's remark. "'And as I have never seen any of Miss Van Norman's writing, I have, of course, no reason to doubt this. But this is the point I want to inquire about. Is it assumed that Miss Van Norman wrote the words on this paper while sitting here at the table last evening, immediately or shortly before her death? Mr. Benson thought a moment, then he said, Without any evidence to the contrary, and indeed without having given this question any previous thought, I think I may say that it has been tacitly assumed that this is a dying confession of Miss Van Norman's. He looked inquiringly at his audience, and Dr. Hills responded. Yes, he said, we have taken for granted that Miss Van Norman wrote the message while sitting here last evening, after the rest of the household had retired. This we infer from the fact of Mr. Carleton's finding the paper on the table when he discovered the tragedy. You thought the same, Mr. Carleton? Of course. I could not do otherwise than to believe Miss Van Norman had written the message and had then carried out her resolve. I think, Mr. Fessenden, resumed the coroner, we may assume this to be the case. Then said Fessenden, I will undertake to show that it is improbable that this paper was written as has been supposed. 
the message is as you see written in pencil the pencil here on the table and which is part of a set of desk fittings is a very hard pencil labeled h a few marks made by it upon a bit of paper will convince you at once that it is not the pencil which was used to write that message the letters as you see are formed of heavy black marks which were made with a very soft pencil such as is designated by two b or b b if you please i will pause for a moment while you satisfy yourself upon this point greatly interested mr benson took the pencil from the pen rack and wrote some words upon a pad of paper dr leonard and dr hills leaned over the table to note results but no one else stirred you are quite right said mr benson this message was not written with this pencil but what does that prove it proves nothing said fessenden calmly but it is pretty strong evidence that the message was not written at this table last night for had there been any other pencil on the table it would doubtless have remained assuming then that miss van norman wrote this message elsewhere and with another pencil it loses the special importance commonly attributed to the words of one about to die it does said mr benson impressed by the fact but at a loss to know whither the argument was leading believing then went on the lawyer that this paper had not been written in this room last evening i began to conjecture where it had been written for one would scarcely expect a message of that nature to be written in one place and carried to another i was so firmly convinced that something could be learned on this point that just before we were summoned to this room i asked permission of mrs markham to examine the appointments of miss van norman's writing desk in her own room and i found in her desk no soft pencils whatever there were several pencils of gold and of silver and of ordinary wood but the lead in each was as hard as this one on the library table urged on by what seemed to me important developments i persuaded mrs markham to let me examine all of the writing desks in the house i found but one soft pencil and that was in the desk of miss dupuy miss van norman's secretary it is quite conceivable that miss van norman should write at her secretary's desk but i found myself suddenly confronted by another disclosure and that is that the handwritings of miss van norman and miss dupuy are so similar as to be almost identical in view of the importance of this written message should it not be more carefully proved that this writing is really miss van norman's own it should indeed declared coroner benson who was by this time quite ready to agree to any suggestion mr fessenden might make will somebody please ask miss dupuy to come here i will said miss morton and rising she quickly rustled from the room of course every one present immediately remembered that miss dupuy had left the room in a fit of hysterical emotion and wondered in what frame of mind she would return nearly every one too resented miss morton's officiousness whatever errand was to be done she volunteered to do it quite as if she were a prominent member of the household instead of a lately arrived guest this similarity of penmanship is a very important point observed mr benson a very important point indeed i am surprised that it has not been remarked sooner i've often noticed that they wrote alike said kitty french impulsively but i never thought about it before in this matter you see she involuntarily addressed herself to the coroner who listened with interest you see madeline instructed cicely to write as nearly as possible like she did because cicely was her social secretary and answered all her notes 
and wrote letters for her, and sometimes Cicely signed Madeline's name to the notes, and the people who received them thought Maddy wrote them herself. She didn't mean to deceive, only sometimes people don't like to have their notes answered by a secretary, and so it saved a lot of trouble. I confess, Kitty concluded, that I can't always tell the difference in their writing myself, though I usually can. Miss Morton returned, bringing Cicely with her. Still officious of manner, Miss Morton rearranged some chairs and then seated herself in the front row with Cicely beside her. She showed what seemed almost an air of proprietorship in the girl, patting her shoulder and whispering to her, as if by way of encouragement. But Miss Dupuy's demeanor had greatly changed. No longer weeping, she had assumed an almost defiant attitude, and her thin lips were tightly closed in a way that did not look promising to those who desired information. With a conspicuous absence of tact or diplomacy, Mr. Benson asked her abruptly, "'Did you write this paper?' I did, said Cicely, and as soon as the words were uttered, her lips closed again with a snap. Her reply fell like a bombshell upon the breathless group of listeners. Tom Willard was the first to speak. What? he exclaimed. Maddy didn't write that? You wrote it? Yes, asserted Cicely, looking Tom squarely in the eyes. "'When did you write it?' asked the coroner. "'A week or more ago.' "'Why did you write it?' "'I refuse to tell.' "'Who is the S mentioned in this paper?' "'I refuse to tell.' "'You needn't tell. That is outside the case. It is sufficient for us to know that Miss Van Norman did not write this paper. If you wrote it, it has no bearing on the case. Your penmanship is very like hers. I practiced to make it so, said Cicely. Miss Van Norman desired me to do so, that I might answer unimportant notes and sign her name to them. They were in no sense forgeries. Ladies frequently have their own names signed by their secretaries. Miss Van Norman often received notes like that. Why did you not tell before that you wrote this paper supposed to have been written by Miss Van Norman? Nobody asked me. Miss Dupuy's tone was defiant and even pert. Robert Fessenden began to look at the girl with increasing interest. He felt quite sure that she knew more about the tragedy than he had expected. His detective instinct became immediately alert and he glanced significantly at Kitty French. She was breathlessly watching Cicely, but nothing could be learned from the girl's inscrutable face, and to an attentive listener her very voice did not ring true. Dr. Leonard and Dr. Hills looked at each other. Both remembered that the night before Cicely had stealthily opened the door of the library and put her head in but seeing them had quickly gone back again. This information might or might not be of importance, but after a brief whispered conference the two men concluded that it was not the time then to refer to it. Mr. Carleton, though still pale and haggard of face, seemed to have taken on new interest and listened attentively to the conversation, while big, good-natured Tom Willard leaned forward and took the paper, and then sat studying it with a perplexed expression. "'But why did you not volunteer the information? You must have known it was of great importance.' The coroner spoke almost petulantly, and indeed Miss Dupuy had suppressed important information. At his question she became greatly embarrassed. She blushed and looked down, and then, with an effort resuming her air of defiance, she snapped out her answer 
I was afraid. Afraid of what? Afraid that they would think somebody killed Miss Van Norman instead of she killed herself as she did. How do you know she did? I don't know it, except that I left her here alone when I went to my room, and the house was all locked up, and soon after that she was found dead. So she must have killed herself. Those conclusions, said the coroner pompously, are for us to arrive at, not for you to declare. The case, he then said, turning toward the doctors and the young detective, is entirely changed by the hearing of Miss Dupuy's testimony. The fact that the note was not written by Miss Van Norman will, I'm sure, remove from the minds of the doctors the possibility of suicide. It certainly will, said Dr. Leonard. I quite agree with Dr. Hills that except for the note all evidence is against the theory of suicide. Then, went on Mr. Benson, if it is not a suicide, Miss Van Norman must have been the victim of foul play, and it is our duty to investigate the matter and attempt to discover whose hand it was that wielded the fatal dagger. Mr. Benson was fond of high-sounding words and phrases, and, finding himself in charge of what promised to be a mysterious, if not a celebrated, case, he made the most of his authoritative position. Robert Fessenden paid little attention to the coroner's speech. His brain was working rapidly, and he was trying to piece together such data as he had already accumulated in the way of evidence. It was but little, to be sure, and in lieu of definite clues he allowed himself to speculate a little on the probabilities. But he realized that he was in the presence of a mysterious murder case, and he was more than willing to do anything he could toward discovering the truth of the matter. The known facts were so appalling, and any evidence of undiscovered facts was as yet so extremely slight, that Fessenden felt there was a great deal to be done. He was trying to collect and systematize his own small fund of information when he realized that the audience was being dismissed. Mr. Benson announced that he would convene a jury and hold an inquest that same afternoon, and then he would expect all those now present to return as witnesses. Without waiting to learn what the others did, Fessenden turned to Kitty French and asked her to go with him for a stroll. "'You need fresh air,' he said as they stepped from the veranda. "'But also I need you to talk to. I can formulate my ideas better if I express them aloud, and you are such a clear-headed and sympathetic listener that it helps a lot.' Kitty smiled with pleasure at the compliment. Then her pretty face became grave again, as she remembered what must be the subject of their conversation. "'Before I talk to the lawyers or detectives who will doubtless soon infest the house, I want to straighten out my own ideas.' "'I don't see how you can have any,' said Kitty. I mean, of course, any definite ideas about who committed the murder. I haven't really definite ones, but I want you to help me get some. Well, said Kitty, looking provokingly lovely in her serious endeavor to be helpful, let's sit down here and talk it over. Here was a sort of rustic arbor, which was a delightful place for a tete-a-tete, but not at all conducive to deep thought or profound conversation. "'Go on,' said Kitty, pursing her red lips and puckering her white brow in her determination to supply the help that was required of her. "'But I can't go on if you look like that. All logic and deduction fly out of my head, and I can think only of poetry and romance.' and it won't do. At least not now. 
can't you give a more successful imitation of a coroner's jury kitty tried to look stupid and wise both at once and only succeeded in looking bewitching it's no use said fessenden i can't sit facing you as i would the real thing in the way of juries so i'll sit beside you and look at the side of that distant barn while we talk so he turned partly round and fixing his gaze on the stolid red barn said abruptly who wrote that paper i don't know said kitty feeling that she couldn't help much here somehow i can't seem to believe that dupuy girl wrote it she sounded to me like a lady reciting a fabrication i thought that too said kitty i never liked cicely because i never trusted her but matty was very fond of her and she wouldn't have been unless she had found cicely trustworthy come to luncheon you two said tom willard as he approached the arbor oh mr willard said kitty who do you think wrote that paper why miss dupuy said tom in surprise she owned up to it yes i know but i'm not sure she told the truth i don't know why she shouldn't said tom thoughtfully and then he added gently and after looking at it closely i felt sure myself it wasn't maddy's writing after all then it must be cicely's said kitty i admit i can't tell them apart and then the three went back to the house end of chapter eight chapter nine of the clue by carolyn wells this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 The Will Immediately after luncheon, Lawyer Peabody came. This gentleman had had charge of the Van Norman legal matters for many years, and it was known by most of those present that he was bringing with him such wills or other documents as might have a bearing on the present crisis. Mr. Peabody was an old man. Moreover, he had for many years been intimately associated with the Van Norman household, and had been a close friend of both Richard Van Norman and Madeline. Shattered and broken by the sad tragedy in the household, he could scarcely repress his emotion when he undertook to address the little audience. But the main purport of his business there at that time was to announce the contents of the two wills in his possession. The first one, the will of Richard Van Norman, was no surprise to anyone present, except perhaps those few who did not live in Mapleton. One of these, Robert Fessenden, was extremely interested to learn that because of Madeline's death before her marriage, and also before she was twenty-three years of age, the large fortune of Richard Van Norman, which would have been hers on her wedding day, passed at once and unrestrictedly to Tom Willard. But also by the terms of Richard Van Norman's will, the fine old mansion and grounds, and a sum of money, modest in comparison with the whole fortune, but ample to maintain the estate, were Madeline's own, and had been from the day of her uncle's death. Possessed of this property, therefore, Madeline had made a will which was dated a few months before her death, and which Mr. Peabody now read. After appropriate and substantial bequests to several intimate friends, to her housekeeper and secretary, and to all the servants, Madeline devised that her residuary fortune and the Van Norman house and grounds should become the property of Miss Elizabeth Morton. This was a complete surprise to all, with the possible exception of Miss Morton herself, 
it was not easy to judge from her haughty and self-satisfied countenance whether she had known of this before or not. Fessenden, who was watching her closely, was inclined to think she had known of it, and again his busy imagination ran riot. The first point, he thought to himself, in discovering a potential murderer is to inquire who will be benefited by the victim's death. Apparently the only ones to profit by the passing of Madeline Van Norman were Tom Willard and Miss Morton. But even the ingenious imagination of the young detective balked at the idea of connecting either of these two with the tragedy. He knew Willard had not been in the house at the time of the murder, and Miss Morton, as he had chanced to discover, had occupied a room on the third floor. Moreover, it was absurd on the face of things to fancy a well-bred middle-aged lady stealing downstairs at dead of night to kill her charming young hostess. It was with a sense of satisfaction, therefore, that Fessenden assured himself that he had formed no suspicion whatever and could listen with a mind entirely unprejudiced to such evidence as the coroner's inquiry might bring forth. He was even glad that he had not discussed the matter further with Kitty French. He still thought she had clear vision and good judgment, but he had begun to realize that in her presence his own clearness of vision was dazzled by her dancing eyes and a certain distracting charm which he had never before observed in any woman. But he told himself somewhat sternly that feminine charm must not be allowed to interfere with the present business in hand, and he seated himself at a considerable distance from Kitty French when it was time for the inquest. A slight delay was occasioned by waiting for Coroner Benson's own stenographer, but when he arrived the inquiry was at once begun. At the request of Miss Morton, or, it might rather be said, at her command, the whole assembly had moved to the drawing-room, it being a much larger and more airy apartment, and withal less haunted by the picture of the tragedy itself. And yet to hold a coroner's inquiry in a room gay with wedding decorations was almost, if not quite, as ghastly, but Coroner Benson paid no heed to emotional considerations, and conducted himself with the same air of justice and legality as if he had been in a courtroom or the town hall. As for the jury he had gathered, the half-dozen men, though filled with righteous indignation at the crime committed in their village, wasted no thought on the incongruity of their surroundings. Coroner Benson put his first question to Mrs. Markham, as he considered her, in a way at least, the present head of the household. To be sure, the house now legally belonged to Miss Morton, and that lady was quickly assuming an added air of importance, which was doubtless the result of her recent inheritance. But Mrs. Markham was still housekeeper and by virtue of her long association with the place, Mr. Benson chose to treat her with exceeding courtesy and deference. But Mrs. Markham, though now quite composed and willing to answer questions, could give no evidence of any importance. She testified that she had seen Madeline last at about ten o'clock the night before. This was after the guests who had been at dinner had gone away and the house guests had gone to their rooms. Miss Van Norman was alone in the library, and as Mrs. Markham left her, she asked her to send Cicely Dupuy to the library. Mrs. Markham had then gone directly to her own room, which was on the second floor, above the drawing room. It was at the front of the house, and the room behind it, also over the long drawing room, was the one now devoted to the exhibition of Madeline's wedding gifts. Mrs. Markham had retired almost immediately, and had heard no unusual sounds. She explained, however, 
that she was somewhat deaf, and had there been any disturbance downstairs, it was by no means probable that she would have heard it. "'What was the first intimation you had that anything had happened?' asked Mr. Benson. "'Kitty French came to my door and called to me. Her excited voice made me think something was wrong, and, dressing hastily, I came downstairs, to find many of the household already assembled.' "'And then you went into the library?' "'Yes. I had no idea Madeline was dead. I thought she had fainted, and I went toward her at once.' "'Did you touch her?' "'Yes, and I saw at once she was not living. But Miss Morton said perhaps she might be, and then she telephoned for Dr. Hills.' "'Can you tell me if the house is carefully locked at night?' "'It is, I am sure, but it is not in my province to attend to it.' "'Whose duty is it?' "'That of Harris, the butler.' "'Will you please call Harris at once?' Mr. Benson's tone of finality seemed to dismiss Mrs. Markham as a witness, and she rang the bell for the butler. Harris came in, a perfect specimen of that type of butler that is so similar to a certain type of bishop. Aside from the gravity of the occasion, he seemed to show a separate gravity of position, of importance, and of all-embracing knowledge. "'Your name is Harris?' said Mr. Benson. "'Yes, sir. James Harris, sir.' You have been employed in this house for some years? Seventeen years and more, sir. Is it your duty to lock up the house at night? It is, sir. Mr. Van Norman was most particular about it, sir, being as how the house is alone like in the grounds, and there being so much trees and shrubberies about. There are strong bolts to doors and windows? Most especial strong, sir. It was Mr. Van Norman's wish to make it impossible for burglars to get in. And did he succeed in this? He did, sir, for sure. There are patent locks on every door and window, more than one on most of them, and whenever Mr. Van Norman heard of a new kind of lock, he'd order it at once. Is the house fitted with burglar alarms? No, sir. Mr. Van Norman depended on his safety locks and strong bolts. He said he didn't want no alarm, because it was forever getting out of kilter, and bolts were sure, after all. And every night you make sure that these bolts and fastenings are all secured in place? I do, sir, and I have done it for many years. You looked after them last night as usual? Sure, sir. Every one of them I attended to myself. You can testify, then, that the house could not have been entered by a burglar last night? asked Mr. Benson. Not by a burglar, nor by anybody else, sir unless they broke down a door or cut out a pane of glass. Yet Mr. Carlton came in. Harris looked annoyed. Of course, sir. Anybody could come in the front door with a latch key. I didn't mean that they couldn't. But all the other doors and windows were fastened all right, and I found them all right this morning. You made a careful examination of them? Yes, sir. Of course, we was all up through the night, and as soon as I learned that Miss Madeline was... was... gone, sir, I felt I ought to look about a bit, and everything was as right as could be, sir. No burglar was into this house last night, sir. How about the cellar? We never bother much about the cellar, sir, as there's nothing down there to steal, 
unless they take the furnace or the gas meter. But the door at the top of the cellar stairs, as opens into the hall, sir, is locked every night with a double lock and bolt besides. Then no burglar could come up through the cellar way? That he couldn't, sir, nor yet down through the skylight, for the skylight is bolted every night, same as the windows. And the windows on the second floor, are they fastened at night? They are in the halls, sir, but of course in the bedrooms I don't know how they may be, that is, the occupied bedrooms. When the guest rooms are vacant, I always fasten those windows. Then you can testify, Harris, that there was no way for anyone to enter this house last night except at the front door with a latch key or through the window of some occupied bedroom? I can swear to that, sir. You are sure you've overlooked no way, no back window or seldom used door? Harris was a little hurt at this insistent questioning, but the coroner recognized that this was a most important bit of evidence, and so pressed his questions. "'I'm sure of it, sir. Mr. Van Norman taught me to be most thorough about this matter, and I've never done different since Miss Madeline has been mistress here.' "'That is all. Thank you, Harris. You may go.' Harris went away, his honest countenance showing a look of relief that his ordeal was over, and yet betokening a perplexed anxiety also. Cicely Dupuy was next called upon to give her evidence, or rather to continue the testimony which she had begun in the library. The girl had a pleasanter expression than she had shown at the previous questioning, but a red spot burned in either cheek, and she was clearly trying to be calm, though really under stress of a great excitement. "'You were with Miss Van Norman in the library last evening?' began Mr. Benson, speaking more gently than he had been doing, for he feared an emotional outburst might again render this witness unavailable. "'Yes,' said Miss Dupuy in a low tone, when Mrs. Markham came upstairs, she stopped at my door and said Miss Van Norman wanted me, and I went down immediately. "'You have been Miss Van Norman's secretary for some time?' "'For nearly five years.' "'What were your duties?' "'I attended to her social correspondence, helped her with her accounts, both household and personal.' read to her, and often did errands and made calls for her. She was kind to you? She was more than kind. She treated me always as her social equal and as her friend. Cicely's blue eyes filled with tears, and her voice quivered as she spoke this tribute to her employer. Again Mr. Benson feared she would break down and changed his course of questioning. "'At what time did you go to the library last evening?' "'It could not have been more than a few minutes past ten. "'What did you do there?' "'Miss Van Norman dictated some lists of matters to be attended to, and she discussed with me a few final arrangements for her wedding.' Did she seem about as usual in her manner? Yes, except that she was very tired and seemed a little preoccupied. And then she dismissed you? Yes, she told me to go to bed and said that she should sit up for an hour or so and would write some notes herself. Apparently she did not do so, as no notes have been found in the library. That must be so, sir. But as she said this, a change came over Miss Dupuy's face. She seemed to think that the absence of those notes was of startling importance, and though she tried not to show her agitation, 
it was clearly evident from the way she bit her lower lip and clenched her fingers at what time did miss van norman dismiss you asked mr benson seeming to ignore her embarrassment at half past ten did you retire at once no i had some notes to write for miss van norman and also some of my own and i sat at my desk for some time i don't know just how long and then what happened at this question cicely dupuy became more nervous and embarrassed than ever she hesitated and then made two or three attempts to speak each one of which resulted in no intelligible sound end of chapter nine chapter ten of the clue by carolyn wells this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten some testimony there is nothing to fear said mr benson kindly simply tell us what you heard while sitting there writing that caused you to leave your room glancing around as if in search of someone cicely finally managed to make an audible reply i heard a loud cry she said that sounded as if somebody were frightened or in danger i naturally ran out into the hall and looking over the baluster i saw mr carleton in the hall below i felt sure then that it was he who had cried out so i came downstairs at what time was this at half past eleven exactly how do you know so accurately because as i came downstairs the old clock in the middle landing chimed the half hour it has a deep soft note and it struck just as i passed the clock and it startled me a little so of course i remember it perfectly and then and then cicely again hesitated but with a visible effort resumed her speech why and then i came on down and found mr carleton nearly distracted i could not guess what was the matter he was turning on the lights and ringing the servants bells and acting like a man beside himself then in a moment marie appeared and gave one of her french shrieks that completely upset what little nerve i had left and what did you do next i i went into the library why cicely looked up suddenly as if startled but after only an instant's hesitation replied because mr carleton pointed toward the doorway and marie and i went in together you knew at once that miss van norman was not alive i was not sure but marie went toward her and then turned away with another of her horrid screams and i felt that miss van norman must be dead what did mr carleton say he said nothing he he pointed to the written paper on the table which you had written yourself yes but he didn't know that cicely spoke eagerly as if saying something of importance he thought she wrote it never mind that point for the moment but i must now ask you to explain that written message which you have declared that you yourself wrote at this cicely's manner changed she became again the obstinate and defiant woman who had answered the coroner's earlier questions i refuse to explain it consider a moment said mr benson quietly sooner or later perhaps at a trial you will be obliged to explain this matter how much better then to confide in us now and perhaps lead to an immediate solution of the mystery cicely pondered a moment then she said i have nothing to conceal i will tell you i did write that paper and it was the confession of my heart 
I am very miserable, and when I wrote it, I quite intended to take my own life. When I was called to go to Miss Van Norman in the library, I gathered up some notes and lists from my desk to take to her. In my haste, I must have included that paper without knowing it, for when I reached my room, I could not find it. And then, then when I saw it, there in the table, I... Cicely had again grown nervous and excited. Her voice trembled, her eyes filled with tears, and fearing a nervous collapse, Mr. Benson hurried on to other questions. Whom does that S in your note stand for? That I shall never tell. The determination in her voice convinced him that it was useless to insist on that point, so the coroner went on. Perhaps we have no right to ask. Now, you must tell me some other things. And believe me, my questions are not prompted by curiosity, but are necessary to the discovery of the truth. Why did Mr. Carleton point to that paper? He, he seemed so shocked and stunned that he was almost unable to speak. I suppose he thought that would explain why she had killed herself. But she hadn't killed herself. But he thought she had, and he thought that paper proved it. But why had he need to prove it, and to you? I don't know. I don't know what he thought. I don't know what I thought myself after I reached the library door and looked in and saw that dreadful sight. Oh, I shall see it all my life. At the memory, Cicely broke down again and sank into her chair, shaking with convulsive sobs. Mr. Benson did not disturb her further, but proceeded to question the others. The account of Marie, the maid, merely served to corroborate what Cicely had said. Marie, too, had heard Carlton's cry for help, and throwing on a dressing gown, had run downstairs to Madeline's room. Not finding her mistress there, she had hurried down to the first floor, reaching the lower hall, but a few minutes after Cicely did. She said also that it was just about half-past eleven by the clock in her own room when she heard Mr. Carleton's cry. "'You knew who it was that had called out so loudly?' asked Mr. Benson. "'No, monsieur. I heard only the shriek.' as of one in great disaster. I ran to Miss Van Norman's room, as that was my first duty. Were you not in attendance upon her? No, she had sent me the message by Miss Dupuy that I need not attend her when she retired. Did this often occur? Not often, but sometimes when Miss Van Norman sat up late by herself, she would excuse me at an earlier hour. She was most kind and considerate of everybody. Then when at last you saw Miss Van Norman in the library, what did you do? Mon Dieu, I shrieked. Why not? I was amazed, shocked, but above all, desolated. It was a cruel scene. I knew not what to do, so naturally I shrieked. Marie's French shrug almost convinced her hearers that truly that was the only thing to do on such an occasion. "'And now,' said Coroner Benson, "'can you tell us of anything, any incident or any knowledge of your own, that will throw any light on this whole matter?' Marie's pretty face took on a strange expression. It was not fear or terror, but a sort of perplexity. She gave a furtive glance at Mr. Carleton, and then at Miss Morton, and hesitated. At last she spoke slowly. If Monsieur could perhaps word his question a little differently, with more of a definiteness... Very well. Do you know anything of Miss Van Norman's private affairs that would assist us in discovering who killed her? No, Monsieur. Monsieur. 
said Marie promptly, with a look of relief. Did Miss Van Norman ever, in the slightest way, express any intentions or desire to end her life? Never, monsieur. Do you think she was glad and happy in the knowledge of her fast approaching wedding day? I am sure of it, and Marie's tone was that of one who well knew whereof she spoke. That is all, then, for the present. And Marie, with another sidelong, curious glance at Miss Morton, resumed her seat. Kitty French and Molly Gardner were questioned, but they told nothing that would throw any light on the matter. They had heard the cry, and while hastily dressing, had heard the general commotion in the house. They had thought it must be a fire, and not until they reached the library did they know what had really happened. And then, said Kitty indignantly, in conclusion of her own recital, we were not allowed to stay with the others, but were sent to our rooms. So how can we give any evidence? It was plain to be seen. Miss French felt herself defrauded of an opportunity that should have been hers. But Miss Gardner was of quite a different mind. She answered in whispered monosyllables the questions put by the coroner, and as she knew no more than Kitty of the whole matter, she was not questioned much. Robert Fessenden smiled a little at the different attitudes of the two girls. He knew Kitty was eager to hear all the exciting details, while Molly shrank from the whole subject. However, as they were such minor witnesses, the coroner paid little serious attention to them or to their statements. Miss Morton's testimony came next. Fessenden regarded her with interest, as, composed and calm, she waited the coroner's interrogations. She was deliberate and careful in making her replies, and it seemed to the young detective as if she knew nothing whatever about the whole affair but was trying to imply that she knew a great deal. "'You went to your room when the others did, at about ten o'clock?' asked Mr. Benson. "'Yes, but I did not retire at once.' "'Did you hear any sounds that caused you alarm?' "'No, not alarm. Curiosity, perhaps.' but that is surely pardonable to a naturally timid woman in a strange house. Then did you hear sounds? Can you describe them? I do not think they were other than those made by the servants attending to their duties. But the putting on of coal or the fastening of windows are noticeable sounds when one is not accustomed to them. You could discern, then, that it was the shoveling of coal or the fastening of windows that you heard? No, I could not. My hearing is extremely acute, but as my room is on the third floor, all the sounds I hear were faint and muffled. Did you hear Mr. Carlton's cry for help? I did, but at that instant it did not sound loud. However, I was sufficiently alarmed to open my door and step out into the hall. I had not taken off my evening gown, and, seeing bright lights downstairs, of course I immediately went down. The household was nearly all assembled when I reached the library. I saw at once what had happened, and I saw, too, that Mrs. Markham and the younger women were quite frantic with fright and excitement. I thought it my duty, therefore, to take up the reins of government, and I took the liberty of telephoning for the doctor. I think there is nothing more of importance that I can tell you. At this Fessenden barely repressed a smile, for he could not see that Miss Morton had told anything of importance at all. "'I would like,' said Mr. Benson, "'for you to inform us as to your relations with the Van Norman household.' Have you been long acquainted with Miss Van Norman? About two years, replied Miss Morton, with a snapping together of her teeth 
which was one of her many peculiarities of manner. And how did the acquaintance come about? Her uncle and I were friends many years ago, said Miss Morton. I knew Richard Van Norman before Madeline was born. We quarreled, and I never saw him again. After his death, Madeline wrote to me, and several letters passed between us. At her invitation, I made a short visit here about a year ago. Again, at her invitation, I came here yesterday to be present at her wedding. Miss Morton's manner, though quiet, betokened repressed excitement rather than suppressed emotion. In no way did her hard, bright eyes show grief or sorrow, but they flashed in a way that indicated high nervous pressure. "'Did you know that you were to inherit this house and a large sum of money at Miss Van Norman's death?' The question was thrown at her so suddenly that Miss Morton almost gasped. She hesitated for an appreciable instant, then with a sudden snap of her strong, angular jaws, she said, "'No!' "'You had no intimation of it, whatever?' "'No!' again that excessive decision of manner, which to Fessenden's mind, at least, stultified rather than corroborated the verity of her statement. But Coroner Benson expressed no doubt of his witness, but merely said casually, "'Yet on the occasion of the tragedy last night, you at once assumed the attitude of the head of the house. You gave orders to the servants.' you took up the reins of management and seemed to anticipate the fact that the house was eventually to be your own. Miss Morton looked aghast. If one chose to think so, she looked as if detected in a false statement. Glancing around the room, she saw the eyes of Kitty French and of Marie, the maid, intently fixed on her. This seemed to unnerve her, and in a broken, trembling voice, almost a whine, she said, "'If I did so, it was only with a helpful motive. Mrs. Markham was so collapsed with the shock she had just sustained that she was really incapable of giving orders. If I did so, it was only from the desire to be of service.' This seemed indeed plausible and the most casual observer would know that Miss Morton's helpfulness could only be accomplished in a peremptory and dictatorial manner. "'Will you tell us why Miss Van Norman chose to leave you so large a bequest when she had known you so slightly?' asked Mr. Benson. Fessenden thought Miss Morton would resent this question, but instead she answered, willingly enough, because she knew that except for my unfortunate quarrel with Richard Van Norman many years ago, the place would have been mine anyway. "'You mean you were to have married Mr. Van Norman?' "'I mean just that.' Miss Morton looked a little defiant, but also an air of pride tinged her statement, and she seemed to be asserting her lifelong right to the property." Miss Van Norman, then, knew of your friendship with her uncle and the reason of its cessation? She learned of it about two years ago. How? By finding some letters of mine among Mr. Van Norman's papers shortly after his death. And in consequence of that discovery, she willed you this house at her death? Yes. That is, I suppose she must have done so, as she did so will it. But you did not know of it, and the reading of the will was to you a surprise? Yes, declared Miss Morton, and though the coroner then dismissed her without comment on her statements, there were several present who did not believe the lady spoke voraciously. Tom Willard was called next and Fessenden wondered what would be the testimony of a man who had not arrived on the scene until more than two hours after the deed was done. 
and indeed there was little that Tom could say. Mr. Benson asked him to detail his own movements after he left the house the night before. "'There's little to tell,' said Tom, "'but I'll try to be exact. I went away from this house about ten o'clock, taking with me a suitcase full of clothes. I went directly to the Mapleton Inn, and although I don't know exactly, I should say I must have reached there in something less than ten minutes. Then I went to the office of the establishment, registered, and asked for a room. The proprietor gave me a good enough room, a bellboy picked up my bag, and I went to my room at once. And remained there? Yes. Later I rang for some ice water, which the same boy brought to me. Directly after that I turned in. I slept soundly until awakened by a knocking at my door at about two o'clock in the morning. The message from this house? Yes, the landlord himself stood there when I opened the door and told me I was wanted on the telephone. When I went to the telephone, I heard Miss Morton's voice, and she asked me to come over here. I came as quickly as possible, and— Tom's voice broke at this point, and feeling that his story was finished, Mr. Benson considerately asked him no further questions. End of chapter 10Chapter Eleven of The Clue by Carolyn Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven I Decline to Say. Schuyler Carleton was questioned next. When Mr. Benson asked him to tell his story, he hesitated and finally said that he would prefer to have the coroner ask direct questions, which he would answer. Did you go away from this house with the other guests at about ten o'clock last evening? No, I was not here at dinner. I left at about half past five in the afternoon. Where did you go? I went directly home and remained there until late in the evening. Mr. Fessenden was with you? He was with us at dinner. He is staying at my house, as he was invited to be best man at the wedding. Though this statement came calmly from Carleton's lips, it was evident to all that he fully appreciated the tragic picture it suggested. He was with you through the evening? Part of the time. He went early to his room, saying he had some business to attend to. Why were you two not here to dinner with Miss Van Norman? Fessenden looked up, surprised at this question. Surely Mr. Benson had gathered odd bits of information since morning. Schuyler Carleton looked stern. I did not come because I did not wish to. Mr. Fessenden remained with me, saying he did not care to attend the dinner unless I did. Carlton looked casually at Fessenden as he said this, and though there was no question in the glance, Rob nodded his head in corroboration of the witness. "'You spent the entire evening at home, then?' "'Yes, until a late hour.' "'And then?' "'I returned here between eleven and twelve o'clock.' "'To make a call?' No, I came upon an errand. What was the errand? As it has no bearing upon the case, I think it is my privilege to decline to answer. You entered the house with a latch key. I did. Is that latch key your own property? For the time, yes. Mrs. Markham gave it to me a few days ago for my convenience because I have occasion to come to the house so frequently. Was it your intention when you went away in the afternoon to return later? It was. Upon this secret errand? Yes, 
Did you expect to see Miss Van Norman when you entered the house with the latch key? I did not. And when you entered, you discovered the tragedy in the library? Schuyler Carleton hesitated. His dry lips quivered, and his whole frame shook with intense emotion. Yes, he stammered. But the mere fact of that hesitation instantly kindled a spark of suspicion in the minds of some of his hearers. Until that moment, Carleton's excessive agitation had been attributed entirely to his grief at the awful fate which had come to his fiancée. But now, all at once, the man's demeanor gave an impression of something else. Could it be guilt? Fessenden looked at his friend curiously. In his mind, however, no slightest suspicion was aroused, but he wondered what it was that Carlton was keeping back. Surely the man must know that to make any mystery about his call at the Van Norman mansion the night before was to invite immediate and justifiable suspicion. The court had instructed the district attorney to be present at the inquest, and though that unobtrusive gentleman had taken notes and otherwise shown a quiet interest in the proceedings, he now awakened to a more alert manner and leaned forward to get a better look at the white set face of the witness. Carlton looked like a marble image. His refined patrician features seemed even handsomer for their haggard agony. Surely he was in no way responsible for the awful deed that had been done, and yet just as surely he was possessed of some awful secret fear which kept every nerve strained and tense. Endeavoring not to exhibit the surprise and dismay which he felt, Coroner Benson continued his questions. "'And then, when you discovered Miss Van Norman, what did you do?' Carlton passed his hand across his white brow. "'I hardly know,' he said. "'I was stunned, dazed. "'I went toward her, and, seeing the dagger on the floor, "'I picked it up mechanically, scarcely knowing what I did. "'I felt intuitively that the girl was dead, but I did not touch her, "'and, not knowing what else to do, I cried out for help.' and turned on the lights i pushed several electric buttons not knowing which were lights and which bells my principal idea was to arouse the inmates of the house at once who first appeared in answer to your call miss dupuy came running downstairs at once followed by miss van norman's maid and then you pointed to the paper that lay on the table near Miss Van Norman's hand? Yes, I could not speak, and I thought that would tell Miss Dupuy that Miss Van Norman had taken her own life. You thought, then, that Miss Van Norman wrote the message? I thought so then, and I think so now. This, of course, produced a sensation but it was only evidenced by a deeper silence on the part of the startled audience. "'But Miss Dupuy asserts that she wrote it,' said the coroner. To this Schuyler Carleton merely gave a slight bow of his handsome head, but it said as plainly as words that his belief was not altered by Miss Dupuy's assertion. "'Granting for the moment, then,' went on Mr. Benson, that Miss Van Norman did write it, is the message intelligible to you? Intelligible, yes, said Carlton, but, as I have said before, inexplicable. This ambiguous speech meant little to most of the listeners, but it seemed to give Robert Fessenden food for thought, and he looked at Carlton with a new wonder in his eyes. Mr. Carlton, said the coroner, with a note of gravity in his voice. I think it my duty to tell you that your own interests require you to state the nature of your errand to this house last night. I decline to do so, 
then will you state as exactly as you can the hour at which you entered the front door i don't know precisely but miss dupuy has testified that she came downstairs in response to my call at half past eleven i came into the house a, a few moments before that is all said the coroner abruptly mr hunt if you please the man from headquarters who had guarded the present room through the night came in from the doorway where he had been standing will you tell what you know concerning mr carleton's entrance last night said the coroner briefly i was on guard in the present room from nine o'clock on said mr hunt of course i was on the watch out for anything unusual and alert to hear any sound i heard the company go away at ten o'clock i heard most of the people in the house go to their rooms right after that i heard and i also saw miss dupuy go down to the library after that and return to her room at about half past ten i noticed all these things because that is my business but they made no special impression on me as they were but the natural proceedings of the people who belonged here of course i was only on the lookout for intruders i heard the sound of a latch key and i heard the front door open at exactly quarter after eleven i stepped out into the hall and looking downstairs i saw mr carleton enter i also saw miss dupuy in the upper hall looking over the banister she too must have seen mr carleton but as all of this was none of my business and as nobody had entered who hadn't a right to i simply returned to my post at half past eleven i heard mr carleton's cry and saw the lights go up all over the house anything more sir not at present mr hunt miss dupuy did you hear mr carleton come in cicely dupuy turned an angry face toward mr hunt and fairly glared at the mild-mannered man she waited a moment before answering the coroner's question and then as if with a sudden resolve she spoke a sharp quick yes and that was at quarter after eleven it was later declared cicely for mr carleton told you himself that he went directly into the library as soon as he came into the house and as i heard his cry at half past eleven he must have entered only a few moments before schuyler carleton stared at cicely and she returned his gaze his face was absolutely inscrutable a pallid mask that might have concealed emotion of any sort but there was a suggestion of fear in the strange eyes as they gazed at cicely and though it was quickly suppressed it had been noted by those most interested the girl looked straight at him with determination written in every line of her face it was quite evident to the onlookers that a mental message was passing between these two you are sure mr hunt that your statement as to the time is correct said the coroner turning again to him perfectly sure sir it is my business to be sure of the time mr carleton said mr benson there is an apparent discrepancy here which it is advisable for you to explain if you came into this house at quarter after eleven and rang the bells for help at half past eleven what were you doing in the meantime it was out at last the coroner's question though quietly put was equivalent to an accusation every eye in the room was turned toward carleton and every ear waited in suspense for his reply at last the answer came the dazed uncertain look had returned to carleton's face and his voice sounded mechanical 
like that of an automaton as he replied i decline to say i think mr carleton you can scarcely realize the gravity of the moment or the mistake you are making in refusing to answer this question i have nothing to say repeated carleton and his pallor changed to a faint angry flush of red i am sorry said mr benson gently he seemed to have lost his pompous manner in his genuine anxiety for his witness and he looked sorrowfully at Carleton's impassive yet stubborn face. "'As so much hinges on the question of who wrote that paper,' he resumed, "'I will make a test now that ought to convince us all. Miss Dupuy, you say you wrote it, I believe?' "'I did, yes, sir,' said Cicely, stammering a little now, though she had been calm enough a few minutes before." then you know the words on the paper by rote yes sir said cicely uncertain of where this was leading i will ask you then to take this paper and pencil your own pencil and write the same words in the same way once more oh don't ask me to do that implored cicely clasping her hands and looking very distressed I not only ask you, but I direct you to do it, and do it at once. An attendant handed pencil and paper to Cicely, and after a glance at Carleton, who did not meet it, she began to write. Though evidently agitated, she wrote clearly and evenly, and the paper she handed to Coroner Benson a moment later was practically an exact duplicate of the one found on the library table. "'It does not require a handwriting expert,' said the coroner, "'to declare that these two papers were written by the same hand. The penmanship is indeed similar to Miss Van Norman's, of whose writing I have here many specimens, but it is only similar. It is by no means identical.' You may all examine these at your leisure, and can only agree to what I say. The district attorney, who had been comparing the papers, laid them down with an air of finality that proved his agreement with the statements made. And so, went on Mr. Benson, granting as we must that Miss Dupuy wrote the paper, we have nothing whatever to indicate that this case is a suicide. We are therefore seeking a murderer, and our most earnest efforts must be made to that end. I trust, Mr. Carleton, now that you can no longer think Miss Van Norman wrote the message, that you will aid us in our work by stating frankly how you were occupied during that quarter hour which elapsed between your entering the house and your raising the alarm. But Carleton preserved his stony calm. There was no quarter hour, he said. I may have stepped into the drawing room a moment before going to the library, but I gave the alarm almost immediately on entering the house. Certainly immediately on my discovery of, of the scene in the library. Cicely looked defiantly at Mr. Hunt, who, in his turn, looked perplexed. The man had no wish to insinuate anything against Mr. Carleton, but, as he had said, it was his business to know the time, and he knew that Mr. Carleton came into the house at quarter after eleven, and not at half-past. The pause that followed was broken by Coroner Benson's voice. "'There is nothing more to be done at present. The inquest is adjourned until tomorrow afternoon.' but we have discovered that there has been a crime committed. There is no doubt that Miss Van Norman was murdered, and that the crime took place between half-past ten and half-past eleven last night. It is our duty to spare no effort to discover the criminal. As an audience, you are now dismissed. 
End of chapter 11